Have you seen the new Mission Impossible movie? It is in the theaters. It is making a lot of buzz. If you've not seen it yet, spoiler alert. Tom Cruise, who plays Ethan Hunt, is back to saving the world from yet another villain. But this time, the villain is not a mad scientist or a ruthless assassin. It's artificial intelligence or AI. I won't give out the whole plot, but it tells you how AI is everywhere now. It is writing essays, editing photos, composing songs and even choosing military targets. Israel is doing it apparently. Using artificial intelligence to select targets for military strikes. It is slowly embedding AI systems in its operations. So how does it work? Well, first you feed in a huge amount of data. Everything from drone and CCTV footage to satellite imagery, electronic signals and online communications. Basically, every form of intelligence you have. You feed all of it, the machine goes through all of it, it crunches the data, and in the end, it comes up with a list of targets to strike. Basically, a list of targets that the machine recommends. And the AI model does not just select targets, it also plans the operation for you. Once you have these targets set, another AI model jumps into action. This one is called the Fire Factory. So this AI model, the Fire Factory, takes these military-approved targets, it calculates the load of ammunition needed. It sorts them by priority. It assigns targets to aircraft and drones. And then it gives a whole schedule for the strikes. Sounds like a complete package, right? From locking targets to handling the logistics. Right now, these machines are not functioning autonomously. Every strike that the AI model suggests is being vetted and approved by a human. But this is not Israel's first time using AI in warfare. The biggest example was the Gaza War of 2021. Tel Aviv called it the first AI war. It used artificial intelligence to identify launch pads and deploy drones. So they've been doing it for a while. This latest move is being seen as an expansion, a new frontier in AI warfare. It may sound like an exciting development, but it also raises some very important questions. First is that of accountability. What happens if the machine orders a wrong strike? The idea for the Israeli Defense Force argues that the targets are vetted by humans. But this is just the nascent stage. What happens when these systems become fully autonomous? Who do you blame for a wrong strike? The machine or the developer? Or will you blame the officials who deployed it? Can a machine really decide who lives and who dies? That's one question. The second question is, how reliable are these systems? AI models work on the data they're fed. What if this data is flawed or biased? The end result will also be flawed. Also, how secure are these systems? What if they're hacked? What if an enemy gains control of them? It would spell disaster. Imagine rogue strikes on your own people. It sounds like a bad nightmare, but it's very much a possibility because our world is moving towards lethal autonomous weapons, AKA killer robots. Those that can identify and kill targets without human help. Sounds ominous. Thankfully, we're not there yet. But there have been instances where machines acted on their own. For example, what happened in 2020? Armed drones are said to have killed a human for the first time. In 2020, the details are still sketchy. But this is according to the United Nations. A Turkish-made Cargo 2 drone hunted down members of Libya's National Army. The manufacturer says... The drone can classify objects, and this allows it to fire autonomously. So the days of killer robots are not far away, which brings us to another question. Do we have rules in place to manage them? And we are not the only ones raising these questions. The United Nations Security Council is doing the same. They will meet in New York on the 18th of July. On the agenda is a formal discussion on AI. Please, please. Governments want to see how they can regulate it. And this is not a new conversation. The United Nations has been pushing to ban killer robots for some time now, but countries like the United States and Russia are not on board. They say instead of a ban, there should be guidelines. And it's not every day that the US and Russia agree on something. Guess it takes killer robots to unite them. But ban or no ban, there is still no international law that regulates the use of AI in warfare. In fact, there is no single international law to regulate AI. So how do we avoid an existential disaster? Killer robots are no longer fiction. And this isn't the first time the world is facing a new technology. What we need is consensus and regulation. 
hopefully before the damage is done. That's the story of Russia's invasion. More than 500 days compressed into a few seconds. It tells you the whole story. Ukraine launched a major counterattack last year. They had some success. They liberated areas in the south and the east. But that was in November 2022. Since then, very little has changed. I know the famous Russian winter has not arrived yet, but the front lines are frozen. So what are both sides doing? They're betting on unconventional attacks. We saw one in Crimea today. This important bridge between Russia and Crimea was attacked. It is called the Kerch Bridge. Two blasts were reported early on Monday. Russia says two people were killed. They have blamed Ukraine and the West for this attack. And what has Ukraine said? Well, nothing so far. It's been their strategy since last year's counteroffensive: either reject or ignore Russia. Today's attack led to traffic disruptions on the bridge. It's a key route between Russia and Crimea. Without it, moving supplies becomes difficult. So the bridge has strategic value, and this is the second time the Kerch Bridge has been attacked. The first was in October 2022. Even then, Ukraine denied attacking it. Last year, the Crimean Bridge attack was followed by a counteroffensive, a successful one. So could this attack be a repeat? Well, this time, the counterattack is already underway. Ukraine began the operation last month. Just one problem, though. It's all gone wrong. Reports say Ukraine has lost 20% of their weapons in the first weeks. 20% wiped out. And remember, these were not Ukraine's own weapons. These were weapons given to them by NATO. So what did Ukraine do? Reports say they have paused. They're rethinking their strategy. Who knows? Maybe sabotage is the new one. If so, it seems to have backfired because Russia says it has decided to halt the Black Sea grain deal. Some context here. The Black Sea grain deal was struck last year. It permitted Ukraine to ship food grains despite the war. That deal was set to expire today. Ukraine wanted to extend it, but Russia has refused. Now, Moscow did not link it to the Crimea attack, but I'm guessing it did not help. What does this decision mean for all parties involved? Ukraine could end up losing a lot of money, no grain shipments, so no payments. The rest of the world could be in trouble too. Ukraine is one of the biggest grain producers in the world. They make up around 9% of all wheat exports. If that wheat is stuck in ports, prices will rise. There will be more inflation. Until now, the Black Sea grain deal has kept things at bay. Food prices had fallen 20% after this deal was signed last year. So if Russia does not make a U-turn, grain importers will be in trouble especially those in Africa, which makes you wonder, what is the point of all this fighting? How does all of it end? Well, one thing's for sure, the war has single-handedly discredited most so-called strategic experts. They said Russia would win within weeks. It's day 509. They said Putin would be weakened by the Wagner mutiny. Turns out the Wagner chief had a meeting with the Russian president, and that two days after the mutiny. My point is, forget the experts. Look at the battlefield reality. Russia is not losing this war at any cost, but neither is Ukraine winning. It has reached a violent and costly stalemate. The problem is, neither side will admit it. The U.S. National Security Advisor was asked this question on Sunday. Has the war reached a stalemate? That was the question. He said no. But the counteroffensive is hard. And what is Russia saying? President Putin is showing appetite for more escalation. He has threatened to use cluster bombs in Ukraine. Listen to this. I'd like to note that the Russian Federation has a sufficient stockpile of different types of cluster munitions. Different types. We haven't done this before. We didn't use them and we didn't have to, despite of a known lack of munitions at a certain period of time. We didn't do it. But of course, if they are used against us, we reserve the right to take reciprocal action. So what next? Now would be the right time for talks, to discuss terms with Russia. Both sides are reeling from battleground losses. Their people and economies are tired. 
Now, I know what you're thinking. If the idea was to talk, why wait until now? Why not in March last year when Russia invaded? Because now Ukraine has sent a strong and clear message. It has shown that it's not a pushover. With the right weapons, Ukrainians can and will defend themselves. And Russia knows this pretty well by now. And Kiev knows that Putin was not bluffing. He was serious about the NATO red line then, and he's serious about it now. Both sides need to start engaging. Because this war is not going to be settled in the battlefield, it needs a political settlement. So America is drawing a line in the ocean. It's their line of defense against China, military defense. But what about financial defense? That could be trickier. China is the only serious threat to America's military power. But their economic power is a different story altogether. Everyone wants a piece of it. And their biggest target, the US dollar. By the way, India is on the same mission, to reduce its dependence on the US dollar. Instead, India wants to use the rupee. And on Saturday, that mission got a huge boost. Prime Minister Modi was in the UAE for an official visit. After the talks, both sides made an announcement. They decided to establish a system to trade in local currencies, basically a rupee dirham trade. How would that work? Well, normally, bilateral trade is done in U.S. dollars. It's widely accepted all over the world. It's backed by the U.S. economy, and it's easy to exchange, the dollar. So buying and selling with the U.S. dollar makes sense. But India and the U.A. are planning to remove the dollar from this equation. So Indian importers will be able to buy using rupees, and Emirati importers will be able to buy in dirhams. How does it help us? For starters, you won't use up a lot of your reserves. Those dollars can be safe in your bank. So more forex stability. And secondly, things will be less volatile. Your import bill will no longer depend on the US dollar, which is the situation right now. If the dollar rises, so will your import expenditure. Your bill goes up. You end up paying more for the same thing. The rupee dirham trade can reduce this volatility. The dollar's tantrums won't affect you, at least not as much. And India is pushing this strategy with multiple partners. Banks from 18 countries have opened special accounts in India. These include Germany, the UK, Israel, Malaysia, and Russia. So the system is very much in place. The question is how many countries are using it? Bangladesh and Sri Lanka have expressed interest. So has Indonesia now. Their finance minister is in India for G20 talks. Both countries are looking at creating a rupee, rupee trade. Rupee is the currency of Indonesia. Indian officials say African and Gulf nations are also keen on the rupee. The key is to translate this, this interest into deals, to sign more local currency agreements with various countries. But that's easier said than done. Look at the rupee-ruble trade, for instance. India and Russia wanted to trade in their own currencies, the rupee and the ruble. Politically, it made sense. But financially, it did not. We buy a lot from Russia, but the Russians don't buy as much from us. So Moscow would have ended up with a huge pile of unusable rupees, which is why the talks are stalled. But India is not giving up. This deal with the UA could be the boost that the rupee needs. And there are three reasons for that. One, there's a lot of money at stake. India-UA trade is almost $85 billion. It is growing at 20% annually. So $100 billion is not really far off. Now, even if some of this trade is done in rupees, it will be a lot of money. Reason number two, the fuel bill. UA is India's fourth biggest source of oil. They sell around 200,000 barrels, 200,000 barrels per day. Imagine if we could buy all of that oil in rupees. Think about how much we could save in dollar reserves. And reason number three, the remittance factor. Around three million Indians live in the UA. They have to send money back home. The rupee dirham trade could help them by reducing the transaction cost, by reducing the settlement time, meaning you can send money faster and at better rates. And I know all of this sounds wonderful, but like with the ruble, there are challenges. You see, India has a huge trade deficit with the UAE, around $15 billion, which means we buy a lot more than we sell them. Most of it is oil. So will the UAE agree to using the rupee, or will they also backtrack like Russia? And that is a big concern. There's some good news on that front, though. I mentioned that India has a trade deficit with the UAE. That was not always the case. Between 2014 and 2017, India, in fact, had a trade surplus with them. We sold more than we bought. 
So the goal is to reach that level again. Then the UAE will be more, more than happy, in fact, to take the rupee. And things are looking good on that front. They're on the right trajectory. India and the UAE signed a free trade agreement last year. Experts say Indian exports are set to double by 2027. If that happens, the rupee dirham trade could also flourish. But what about beyond the UAE? This is where things get a bit tricky. Ideally, India would want to use rupees when there is a deficit because they can save dollar reserves. But those countries are not always willing. Case in point, Russia. Then you have countries with a trade surplus like Bangladesh or Nepal or Sri Lanka. Those countries are more than willing to use local currencies. But, but in these cases, India may not agree. Take Bangladesh, for example. Their exports to India are around $2 billion. But their imports are around $14 billion. So Bangladesh's deficit with India is $12 billion. Now, assume this trade was done in rupees and takas, the Bangladeshi currency, taka. Will India be willing to accept $14 billion worth of Bangladeshi takas? We only need $2 billion for trade. What will we do with the rest? That's the problem with trading in local currency. You need to strike deals with dozens of countries, some with deficits, some with a surplus. Only then can you internationalize the rupee. New Delhi has certainly scored a big win by getting the UAE on board. But the key is to build on this momentum. Now let's talk about Jammu and Kashmir. In a few weeks from now, it will hit a major landmark. Four years since the scrapping of Article 370, a much contested move. It changed the identity of Jammu and Kashmir from a state to a union territory. It was a political, social and security challenge. There was intense scrutiny, both at home and outside. But four years on, the move seems to be paying off. Kashmir is getting foreign investment. It played host to a G20 meeting. It has seen a record number of tourists and its local industries are being revived. Tonight, we bring you one such story of revival, the saffron trade. It's blooming again. This exotic spice of Kashmir now has a GI tag, and prices have shot up by more than 60%. Here's a report. This is Kashmiri saffron. Many call it the red gold, mainly because it's priced just like real gold. One kilogram of the spice can cost up to $4,000. The saffron is part of every royal feast. It has caught the imagination of chefs, aficionados of luxury, even makers of traditional medicine for centuries. Kashmiri saffron was sought after around the world, and its producers enjoyed worldwide recognition. But the king of spices was on the verge of extinction. This is the home of Kashmiri saffron, Pampor, a tiny town right outside the capital city of Srinagar. Many buyers of saffron called Pampur the capital of saffron. More than 20,000 families farm it. They cultivate the saffron completely by hand. They plant the saffron flower between July and September. Roughly eight weeks later, they pluck the flowers and separate each saffron strand by hand. It takes as many as 150,000 flowers to produce one kilo of saffron. The process is labor intensive. Plus, the saffron cannot grow anywhere. The saffron flower is delicate. It's usually planted at an altitude of over 1,600 meters. That's why the Kashmiri saffron is so expensive. In recent decades, the process became a liability. Since the late 1990s, there was a rapid decline in production. Locals claimed the land for cultivation was shrinking and climate change rapidly eroded the soil. Frequent droughts and falling water levels destroyed its fertility. By 2018, production dropped by over 60%. Competition from Iran worsened the situation. It's believed the Iranians brought saffron to Kashmir. In the modern day, they still dominate the global trade. 90% of the world's saffron is made in Iran. Iran's domination became a challenge for Kashmiri producers. They were being undercut in the market by cheaper saffron from Iran. It was being passed off as Kashmiri saffron. The real product was losing its ground fast, and Kashmiri farmers were losing hope. The government attempted a rescue. In 2010, a national saffron mission was launched. $57 million were poured to teach saffron farmers new cultivation methods, but the initiative failed. The turnaround came in 2020. The fix was a new piece of technology, 
a geographical indication or GI tag. This is a first for the saffron industry. The GI tag became the new identity of the Kashmiri saffron. For buyers, the tag was a hallmark of quality. It's given only after a batch passes quality checks. The GI tag has restored trust. It helped in fighting off the competition and verifying the product's authenticity. The buyers are now making a beeline. Earlier this month, the Kashmiri saffron became five times more expensive than silver. About 10 grams of spice was trading at around $40. Despite the steep prices, buyers from lucrative markets like the US, Europe and Canada are picking up Kashmir saffron again. In a short span of time, the humble GI tag has secured three wins. It has helped in building trust, re-established the market for the Kashmir saffron and put the valley back on the world map. In Pakistan, the Prime Minister is stepping down. Shehbaz Sharif has confirmed this. He will leave office before his term concludes. So elections should take place sometime in November. This gives Sharif and his party an extra month to prepare for polls. In the meantime, his administration is having a fire sale, with airports up for grabs, apparently. We're talking about the Islamabad International Airport. Reports say Pakistan is in a rush to outsource it. A meeting was held on Saturday, and outsourcing this airport was listed as a priority. They want to do it before Sharif steps down. What explains this rush? Our next report has the answer. What do you think when you hear the term public sector enterprise? A poorly run bureaucratic nightmare is what most often comes to mind. While that's not the case everywhere, it can be used to describe Pakistan's aviation industry. In recent years, they've had to suspend about 150 pilots flying with dubious licenses. Their national carrier has been banned from flying to the US, UK and Europe. And the airports really aren't being run efficiently, especially the Islamabad International Airport in the country's capital. It opened in 2018 and is already said to be outsourced. The reason is obvious. Pakistan is facing a major economic crisis, so the government needs money by any means possible, including the outsourcing of airport operations. The country is prepared to outsource airport operations for at least 25 years. They're looking for international partners to come and run the airports and make them efficient. Three airports were initially lined up for this treatment. Airports in Islamabad, Karachi and Lahore. The process to find partners began back in March, but there have been no takers so far. So, in a last-ditch attempt to make some kind of progress, Pakistan's aviation ministry has decided to prioritize the privatization. A meeting was held on Saturday and new deadlines were issued. Why the war footing to outsource the airport? As we said earlier, Pakistan really needs the cash. It has recently secured loans from the International Monetary Fund and Saudi Arabia. It is likely to get some money from the UAE as well. But all this still won't be enough to cover Pakistan's foreign debt payments. The country has a $22 billion loan commitment just this year. So any step that will help bring in money is welcome. As we mentioned, Pakistan is looking for international partners. That's because it needs foreign exchange. A foreign partner means the airport outsourcing will rake in dollars instead of the volatile Pakistani rupee. This will go a long way to help Pakistan during the economic crisis. But of course, to bring in foreign partners, Pakistan needs to clean up its act. There's a reason the airports aren't running as efficiently as possible. In a nutshell, it's because of too much involvement by the government. So Pakistan is looking to separate the functions of the government, airlines and airport services. You know, make them commercially viable airports instead of nepotism chambers for government officials. To this end, the Pakistani government wants to amend some laws by the end of the month. This could help restart flights to the West and so make Pakistan's aviation industry more attractive to foreign entities. But there could be another reason for the airport outsourcing rush. It may be seen as the government being financially responsible. That's not a bad memory to leave voters with just before an election. Pakistan is due to have a general election this November. It's a month later than it should happen. But that's by design, because the ruling party will want time to lay the groundwork for a grand return. 
the return of former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif. When Shahbaz Sharif announced that he would step down early, he also teased his big brother's return. He said that Nawaz Sharif would change the destiny of the country if brought back to power. And the government has already undone Nawaz Sharif's lifetime disqualification from office. This was by amending electoral laws. The next step is to make the party popular enough to ensure Nawaz Sharif is elected. Will outsourcing the airport and all the other recent fiscally prudent moves be enough to win the Pakistani people's trust? We'll have to wait till November to find out. Wimbledon has two new champions, Marketa Vondrusova and Carlos Alcaraz. Vondrusova is 24 years old, the first unseeded player to win the women's title. She was a total surprise. Last year, she was a, a tourist in London, nursing an injury. This year, she is a Wimbledon champion. It doesn't get better than this. Then you have Carlos Alcaraz, the 20-year-old men's champion. Both Vondrusova and Alcaraz are young, but that's where the similarities end. Alcaraz is the world number one. He won his first Grand Slam last year, the US Open. He is the ringleader of the new generation. The new brigade has been waiting in the wings for some time now. Federer, Nadal and Djokovic have ruled tennis longer than anyone would have imagined. Sample this. The last time Wimbledon had a men's champion outside the big four, Andy Murray being the fourth one, was in the year 2002. Over two decades ago, Alcaraz was not even born then. Three out of the four big are still playing. Only Federer has retired. While it seems like the next generation is finally ready to take its place in the sun, the question is, why has it taken them so long? You see, any sport is highly competitive, but an individual sport is also isolating. While it takes a village to raise a champion, the player is all alone in the sporting battlefield. You persevere and perish all alone on that tennis court. So it isn't just a physical battle, it's also a mental one. The gladiators of the sport, like Djokovic and Nadal, are known for this. As much for their physical prowess as for their mental acuity. You get nervous watching your favorite players play. Imagine the pressure on them. One shot could make all the difference. One shot stands between your lifelong dream and years of struggle. And talent alone will not get you there. You have to be made of, of sterner stuff. Djokovic comes from war-torn Serbia. Nadal has played with a broken thumb. Andy Murray plays with a metal hip. Federer has put in the hours, day after day, despite his prodigious talent. Monica Silas was stabbed on court while she was unstoppable. While the stabbing derailed her career, it did not deter her from making a comeback. Serena Williams won a Grand Slam while she was pregnant. Her 43-year-old sister, Venus, still plays, even with an autoimmune disease which causes joint pain and fatigue. It's a long list I could go on. In professional sport, giving up is not an option. Not even when you're losing. Not even when it's a case of so close yet so far. Not even when you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Not even when the tank is completely empty. Forgive me if I sound like a Nike ad, but champions just keep on going. Take Djokovic, for instance. Right after losing the Wimbledon final, he talked about a new rivalry with Alcaraz. Imagine the 36-year-old talking of a rivalry with a 20-year-old. Last evening's men's final was poignant for another reason. It had a sense of deja vu, of Wimbledon 2008. Federer was the defending champion then, just as Djokovic was now. And another Spaniard ended his reign. In 2008, it was Rafael Nadal. In 2023, it is Carlos Alcaraz. Alcaraz, like Nadal, is considered a clay court specialist, but on Sunday he changed that, taking even his opponent by surprise. And that's another thing about champions. Old or young, they have to keep reinventing themselves, adapting to different challenges. Because if the road to the top is tough, staying there is even tougher. And even then, no matter how good you are, someday someone will replace you, in sport as in life. I started by saying that the women's winner, Marketa Wondrusova, went on from being a tourist to a champion. The reverse happened to the great Roger Federer. He won the Wimbledon eight times, the most by any man. But this year, he visited as a spectator. If Wondrusova's tale is the stuff of fairy tales, Federer's is Newton's law. The rule of life, what goes up must come down. The only difference between the good and the great is the journey in between and how to make it count. So for 
Carlitos, as he likes to be called because he doesn't want to feel grown up apparently, the real struggle has only just begun. That is the burden of greatness. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. A group of scuba divers spotted an extremely rare creature called the oarfish off the coast of Taiwan. The fish was found with mysterious holes on its body. Last week, India made history by launching Chandrayaan-3. Some people got a chance to witness this moment from a plane. Meanwhile, the FIFA Women's World Cup 2023 will begin soon. An acrobatic skydiver unfurled its banner over New Zealand's Auckland and landed in Eden Park. And finally, we're taking you back in history. On this day, in 1936, the Spanish Civil War began. Troops initiated the uprising under the leadership of General Francisco Franco. The Soviet Union supported Republicans who stood by the Spanish government. Nazi Germany supported the nationalists favored by the military, who favored the military rather. Ultimately, the nationalists won. We're leaving you with that. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Communist salute is used by everybody in Boston. And the government, though not communist itself, is after a hasty training of five days, recruits are rushed to the front. No one can move either way without a pass. The Paramount cameraman shows his. He is allowed through. of normal Thank you.